All the money on LinkedIn is in the mailbox. All of it. Every penny, every pound, as my British friends would say, (laughs) is in the mailbox. What I mean is one-on-one personal messaging. All of the time on LinkedIn, if you come to LinkedIn and treat it like the world's biggest virtual coffee shop, you will make a ton of money. Hello and welcome to The Melting Pot. I'm your host, Dominic Monkhouse. The Melting Pot is a result of my hunger for optimizing business performance. Scaling up organizations, corporate culture, customer addiction, building high-performing teams, along with a few other obsessions. I've spent the last several years working for and with some of the most successful top-performing companies in the world. And this podcast is my attempt to synthesize what I've learned along the way to help you build a higher quality business and live a more fulfilling life. If you enjoy the podcast, you can find more information on today's episode. We do cracking show notes. They're at dominicmonkhouse.com. Okay, hello, welcome. I'm speaking today to the irrepressible John Nemo. He is the man I Guess who to me coined the phrase, the riches are in the niches. Although, of course, if like me, you're in the UK, the riches are in the niches. Doesn't have quite the same ring to it. When I was looking to create a business by around being a business coach, I was looking to see where I might, where I might try and reach a target audience. And LinkedIn seemed perfect. And John seemed to have the perfect mix of tools for me. So I I got a hold of his book, LinkedIn Riches followed his advice, um, watched a lot of his free stuff, listened to his podcast, Neiman Radio, and uh, people started calling, people started contacting me, people started asking me to do work for them. And so it's an absolute delight to have him on the show today to share some of those tips and tricks and techniques and just find out a bit more about his backstory. And some other things that fascinatingly he said, even recently have had a 3x impact on on his revenue particularly some book he's read around self-image and how that's that's had a huge impact on his ability to close close deals so a fantastic conversation he um he speaks fast sometimes i manage to get a word in edgeways but it's a great conversation and i'm sure you'll enjoy it as much as i did my name is john nemo i am a author and trainer I help, especially business coaches, business owners, small business owners, consultants, use platforms like LinkedIn to find and engage and win new business online. How's that? That's fantastic. And and John, as I was saying to you here before we started recording, I was really keen to get you on because the work that you've done has been a real inspiration to me and helped me transition from a corporate world into a world where I'm a solo entrepreneur, I guess. The dream, I mean, but I love it. I love it, man. <laughs> That's my journey too. It's. I was thinking about that this morning, Dominic, and it's like there aren't enough of us, and so when we get together, it's so much fun because we need each other, and isolation can be a big enemy. So I'm glad you had me on. I'm glad you're doing the show. I'm glad the people who are listening, hopefully, either are in that place where they want to leave the corporate day job and, and strike out on their own or they're part of the army that we're in and we need, we need to support each other. So this is great. <laughs> and do you st- I, I haven't looked at your LinkedIn profile. Do you still have a LinkedIn profile of you in a suit and tie though? I do. <laughs> I know. I need to get a new photo. Like that's probably the last time I wore a suit and tie. I think it was, I was just so trained from corporate life to dress up for photos. And I remember the photographer saying, do you normally, cause she saw my personality. She goes, do you normally wear a suit and tie? And I'm like, never she's like well i guess we'll just take it and i'm like should i like you know go down to my undershirt or what <laughs> like, i have a choice but yeah i need to i do need to put something to more me on there for branding but you know you hear my voice you meet me it's pretty it's pretty uh apparent what i'm like so and if you end up on your newsletter or your your mailing list you get terribly cheesy pictures of you and your kids having fun yes yes i'm probably the only guy who intentionally puts photos of himself with popcorn buckets on his head, playing Star Wars with his kids into his email and has a marketing lesson. Like this is part of the content marketing that I teach to clients is you've got to have a story and have a narrative and you need to be a character and you need to share your journey. 
to make yourself memorable, right? Dominic, the biggest sin in marketing and branding is to be boring, right? To be like everyone else. There's a million LinkedIn trainers. There's a million LinkedIn authors, but how many are going to send you emails where they're wearing a popcorn bucket or invoke the greatness of vanilla ice on a training webinar or do 1980s jokes, you know, all my fashion faux pas growing up in the 80s, tube socks. But that's my narrative. That's my story. And one of the things I love about that, when you put yourself out there and, you know, infuse your real self into your content, you attract the right type of clients. You attract people who enjoy your sense of humor, your communication style, your approach, and you repel people that would be a terrible fit. And that's, you know, at the end of the day with all the tools and we're talking across the world here on the internet, it's crazy, but at the end of the day, we still want to connect as human beings. And that's part of what I try to really train people to do, whether it's LinkedIn or content marketing or anything else is how can we infuse and overlay the real life you online? How do we use offline? How do we take the offline real life you that has a coffee with Dominic and wants to hire him right away and put him across online? How does that authenticity and transparency come through? How does that come out in content? And that's the fun of this, man. I love it. And so do you have some examples where you've done that with clients? Yeah, I do. So I'll give you an example of a business coach I was working with named Mary Olk, O-L-K. You can look her up on LinkedIn. And when I started working with her, rewrote her profile, and she's had this big successful career coaching all these executives at big famous companies. And I said, well, what's your story though? Like there's a million coaches, right? So how are we going to niche you and what's your content going to look like? And well, I've done all this high level executive training. I said, what's your story? She's like, oh, well, I grew up, I was the only girl in a house with five older brothers. And I was like, stop right there. Like, (laughs) Big flashing lights went off. I'm like, that's a hook. That's a narrative because she's now, so what I just said with Mary was let's niche you to coach female C-level executives right? Especially in industries that have a lot of men, right? That are down, like women in the workplace, this is a real issue, right? And executive coaching for women. And who better to coach you as a woman in a man's kind of workplace industry building, whatever, than Mary Oak, who literally grew up with five older brothers. She's like, you don't think I know how to handle a, a room full of testosterone? Trust me, I do. And so, so we started crafting content around that. And so her email, I put out her first email, and it was all about telling that story. And it had a photo of her as a little girl with these five, you know, thug older brothers around her. Like, it was perfect. That's the hook. That's the narrative. Now you remember Mary. It's also, it's that niche, isn't it? Yeah. It's stop being one of a gazillion coaches who coaches everybody and being somebody who just coaches female entrepreneurs. And I'll give you an example of another client I did this with. This is a great quick win story. I love quick wins. So I, I helped a client. Her name is Paramita. She's an accountant in New York. And, she, you know, what we said was, let's try to do a niche approach. And we can get into all the you know logistics of LinkedIn. But one of the things I teach on LinkedIn is the riches are in the niches. The more hyper-focused you are on serving a target audience, the more successful you're going to be. And then we should probably back up. But the other thing is not to have your LinkedIn profile page read like a resume, but to really have it be client facing. So when I rewrote Paramita's profile with her, it was hyper niched, it was construction accounting, accounting services for home builders and construction companies. Like that's her LinkedIn headline. Her headline isn't CEO of my own accounting firm, right? No one cares, right? Nobody cares about you. That's what Dale Carnegie taught me on how to win (laughs) friends and influence people. Nobody cares about us. Your prospects, your customers care about themselves morning, noon, and after supper. So when I niched Paramita, we niched her to that construction area, construction accounting. And then I used the profile template I teach that you're familiar with, which is what I do. This Here, we'll get into quick win territory for the listeners right now. One sentence to fix your profile immediately. Okay, write this down. Listen, what I do, and you write it in all capital letters so it stands out like a little headline. What I do, Colin, I help, and you insert your target audience. What I do, I help target audience achieve or get, and you name two or three benefits they want. And then you say, by providing, you know, my product or service. So for Paramita, it was, I help home builders and construction companies increase revenue, reduce over, reduce costs and improve cash flow, which are three benefits that they want by providing industry specific construction accounting services. 
So now we re- rewrote her whole profile with that kind of theme. It's all about them. It's all about how I help you get what you want. 24 hours later, and I can show you, I can pull up my screen share for doing video, but she messages me and she goes, hey, I just got my first client with your new profile rewrite. The guy literally found her on LinkedIn, sent her like a free in mail and said, are you taking on new clients? She closed them for like 25 grand. Like he's signed up. Like that's what I'm talking about. Like that's the quick win, right? Because it's so hyper niched and hyper focused that people are on LinkedIn looking to get their problems solved. They're not here to look and learn about you. I do not care anything about Dominic Monkhouse. I'm sorry. <laughs> I care about John Nemo. Favorite topic in the world, me. Only problems I care about, mine. If Dominic Monkhouse wants to connect with me, how is this guy going to help me get, get something that I want? So when you approach people on LinkedIn, you don't use your job title. You don't you know barf out your resume. You say, you know, what I do, I help this audience get these benefits they want by providing this industry specific service. And you hyper niche it, you niche it so that it's only one or two target audiences, because everyone wants to feel like you're all about me. You've walked in my shoes, you get how the industry works. And that's really where back to my story, that's how I was able to quit my day job and start a business. And so what was your day job? And how long ago did you quit it? I quit back in 2012 on election day. And I'll never forget, I, so I, my background really quickly, I grew up as a son of two English teachers, love reading, love storytelling, love books, went into a career in journalism, worked for newspapers, the Associated Press, transitioned into public relations for different trade associations. And then in 2012, I was working for a labor union for the Minnesota Nurses really safe, easy. I mean, labor union jobs, you can't get fired. It's a union. Like, you know, I'm not going anywhere unless I jumped up on the roof and shouted, I hate unions. I wasn't, I had a safe, cushy job, but I was, I had that entrepreneurial itch. I really wanted to scratch. And I had had a lot of success for them with PR and social media. So I wanted to go out on my own and start my own agency and do this for clients. So I took this crazy leap back in 2012. And this is, I share this because I know what it feels like. I didn't have a nice, soft, cushy landing. I quit my day job with one client that I had picked up on the side, enough money for 30 days. And I had my three boys under the age of 10 at home. And my wife wasn't working. She was only taking care of the kids. So I had no backup plan. The phrase is like, burn the ships, right? Like there is, I will either die and go back and get a day. What I told myself, Dominic, was, I've got enough career experience. I can go get a day job probably if I need to, you know, go interview again, but I'm going to give this a shot. And what I did in 2012 was saw that opportunity with LinkedIn that I just explained how Paramita got the clients. I was able to do that back in 2012. And it really stood out because nobody was using LinkedIn that way back then. So I hyper niched my profile to one target audience. The only client I had at the time was a debt collector. So I had worked PR for a trade association that serves debt collectors. So the best advice I ever got when I quit and left, my brother-in-law said, you should really focus on being a big fish in a small pond. You know, the riches are in the niches with business. And I decided I'd listen to him because he's like a super successful entrepreneur, gazillionaire. I'm like, all right, I'm going to do a he says. So, So I put on LinkedIn. My headline went from John Nemo, CEO of Nemo Media Group, which was my little company in the bedroom with a folding card table. That was the company, right? I'm like, okay, let's stop pretending. So it went John Nemo, headline, debt collection marketing services. What I do, I help debt collectors increase sales, add clients, and improve their reputation by providing industry-specific debt collection marketing and PR services. And then you keep doing this with your profile. So the next line said, what makes me unique? Because I spent two years working for the largest debt collection trade association on the planet, I know the industry. I know all the hoops. I know all the challenges. And they loved it, right? Because, oh, we don't have to explain it to you. You've walked in her shoes. You get it. So once I had that client-facing profile and started connecting, this is the other big thing about LinkedIn that people don't realize, Dominic, is you can go right to the decision makers. Like there are no more gatekeepers. You can go and literally connect directly with the CEO, right? The owner, the exact person who needs to make the decision to hire you. So I started connecting with all the debt collection agency owners. And within 90 days, I had done six figures in sales. So I'd replaced my day job and you know, off and running, never looked back. And so that's the power of this platform, man. I just want people to use it. 
I should buy stock in it. Everybody always is like, do you own stock? Or why are you so, so obsessed with LinkedIn? I'm like, I don't own any stock. I did do a feature on Reed Hoffman once. I never got to talk to him personally. Like, I'm a huge fanboy of it, but it's because it's the fastest and easiest way that I have found to win business online. And the reason LinkedIn is so good, Dominic, is it's one-on-one personal marketing. What did you tell me before we got on air? You're like, I get hit up on LinkedIn all the time. I use your approach. And you're like, what do they all say to you, Dominic? Let's have a coffee, which loosely translates to, I'm pretty much ready to hire you. I'm impressed. Let's just seal the deal. But think of that idea and that theme with LinkedIn. It's one-on-one virtual coffee meetings. You can literally find anyone in the world. There's 700 million people on there that you can connect with. And then the real secret sauce is, how do you overlay and you know treat people online like you would in real life? Because in real life, you wouldn't hammer them with sales pitches and offers and links. You would practice professional courtship and break the ice and banter a little bit. Then you would ask questions and offer value. And that's basically what I teach. And it works incredibly well. Because if you're hyper-focused on what the other person wants and you practice enough rapport building, which by the way, LinkedIn gives all that information to you. Right, you know this. I can look at your profile and see where you live, where you went to school, uh, where you've worked, and I can immediately throw those icebreakers into our engagement and start, you know, talking about your favorite topic in the world, which is Dominic. Like, who doesn't want to talk about Dominic Monkhouse? Is there anybody better? <laughs> I'm on a roll, man. Well, I was just thinking one of the things I wanted to pick up on because I I thought it was a great technique, which was that you picked some people who had a profile at the time when you had no profile and you rewrote their profiles. Oh yeah, to move up to the A-list. So that that whole, you know, finding a thing where it's like, here's some people with a community, with some pull, and you go do something that's a value for them. And that way that helps your profile. And I just thought that was a really neat little trick. Yeah, so one of the things I, I mean, I still am a nobody, but like <laughs> I was a real nobody back then. So I start doing this LinkedIn and getting clients and I'm like, I wrote a book called LinkedIn Riches and, you know, had a little training course and it was going good, but I'm like, I, nobody knows who I am. So I was like, how do I go? I can't just go to John, you know, John Lee Dumas, Entrepreneur on Fire, Chris Brogan, you know, Jarek Robbins, Dan Miller, all these huge names. How do I get them to endorse me or put me on their show or feature me? And I was like, well, you can't just go to people with your hand out and ask. But one of the things I realized was, why don't I offer kind of the the hook I developed was, hey, John Lee Dumas, I know you don't know me, but what I would like to do is with your permission, you don't have to talk to me, I'll do all the research online, with your permission, I'd like to rewrite your LinkedIn profile for you. And I'll send it to you in a you know, Word document. If you like it, you can use it, great. If you don't like it, just delete it and you can forget about me. But the key thing was I didn't ask for their time. I didn't ask for them to lift a finger. I said, I know you, I'm a fan, I love your show. I will go online and kind of apply my approach to it. And they were like, almost all of these A-listers, Brogan and John Lee Dumas and all the other people I now have great testimonials from, Bob Berg, I mean, gosh, Tom Ziegler, son of Zig Ziegler, like, they're all like, sure, you know, why wouldn't I let someone go do free work for me? In an area where I, because a lot of them were like, yeah, LinkedIn, I know a bunch, like, I think Chris Brogan said to me, he goes, you know, I know a bunch of LinkedIn experts, but none of them have ever offered to like rewrite my profile for free. Like, so knock yourself out, Nemo, whoever you are. And I knocked out of the park. Like I brought legitimate value. That's the other thing is you have to really deliver. So I wrote great profiles and they loved them and they used them. And that led to a natural story to now tell their audience, which was, hey, and I never came expecting quid pro quo or with my handout going, well, if I do good, you better put me on your show. It just naturally happened. The principle of reciprocity where they felt like, wow, you did a really good job. I didn't lift a finger. I can use this. They would get quick wins. Then reciprocity, they go, well, what can I do for you? And I would say, well, I'd love to come on your podcast that has like a gajillion downloads. <laughs> And let's tell the story. Let's tell the story of you. Your favorite topic is yourself. Let's go on your podcast and talk about your LinkedIn profile, why I did what I did, and how it's helped you. And then we can turn those into tips for your listeners. And so that worked like gold because now 
I was on Entrepreneur on Fire and Chris Brogan was promoting me to his list and people were having me on these podcasts and it was all about them. So their audience loved it because they're they're fans of Chris or John and like, oh, cool, LinkedIn, I should look at that. Oh, look at John's profile. That looks great. Who did that? Oh, this guy Nemo. And here's the strategy behind why he did it. And then all of a sudden they're driving people my way. And I've now got these endorsements and blurbs and testimonials from big shots. And People always wonder, like, well, how do you get that? You earn it. Like, you don't just get to walk in and go, hi, would you read my book for free? And and I made all some mistakes early in my career, believe me. Like, when I've, I've written eight books, and I wrote my first book, and I remember it was a baseball novel, and I sent it to a Hall of Fame pitcher, Earl Hershiser, was like, would you please read my book and write a blurb? And no. Like, he wrote a nice note, like, saying, who are you? Go away. But this is... <laughs> This is how you build a business. And this is how you build a platform is you can pay to have access to people's audiences, but there's something so much more genuine, Dominic, where I really did you a favor, brought you value, got something that you can use. And I wasn't pushy or sleazy about it because honestly, some of the other A-listers that I did it for just were like, okay, and then didn't do anything, right? Like you didn't go anywhere or they didn't. And that's fine. Like you learned a lot about it. And it was an exercise where, I got enough wins out of that to really, you know, build a platform. And once you get one, I got Brogan first. And once I had him, it was much easier for the other people that know, like, and trust him to go, well, if you worked with Brogan, you must be somewhat sane. Okay. Like, we'll let you. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, that's that's a fun story behind it. Did that then drive your own, God, I can't remember what it used to be called. Now it's called Nemo Radio, but your podcast, did that spin off the back of that? That sort of sharing, or were you already doing that when? I wasn't doing the podcast yet. So like my big thing when I first kind of got on the scene was, and it still is today, my big thing is content marketing. So the more the more I can give you free content and free tips that help you get, get wins and get further into my funnel and get to know, like, and trust me and see goofy photos of me with my kids. It is a likable guy. Like he really knows his stuff. Then I can sell you something. Right. So my big thing with those individuals at the time was, hey, if you need to send people to LinkedInRiches.com, I'm giving away my book for free. And you can still get the whole book for free. You can download the audiobook. You can download the digital file. It's completely free. And people are like, wait, you have your, don't you want, you're going to cannibalize your sales on Amazon. Don't do that. And what I realized was, you realize no one knows who I am. <laughs> no one's going to go on Amazon which is one of the world's biggest search engines, find a good book on LinkedIn and then go, I wonder if he has it for free on his site. Like my Amazon sales did not change, but I sell really well on Amazon. But the people who find my book on Amazon have never heard of me, right? It's not like they're on my website and then leave to go to it. So like I looked at it this way too. I make like $2 on a book sale. I would much rather give you the book for free, get you into my funnel, get you to know, like, and trust me, get you on my email list, warm you up and sell you a $2,000 course or a $10,000 coaching package. I don't need your $2 for the book. I need your attention, right? I need your attention and your interest. And that's the number one model I've used to build my business and scale it and automate it is content. Meaning I will give away stuff that no one in their right mind will give away. Who gives away their whole book for free? Like most authors are like, I'll give you the first chapter free. Like, whoop do you do? Like, here's the whole book. And by the way, people like yourself, like you can use the book and get huge wins. Like I know at the end of the day, either people are going to come back and hire me directly and buy courses and classes, or they're going to refer people who are like, "I that's great. You read this guy's book. He's awesome. Just go hire him. And it works really well because Here's the other big thing I want to say, Dominic, and then I'll get off my soapbox and stop the monologue. But there's too many people online right now claiming authority. Everybody's a ninja. Everybody's a guru, right? Like everyone claims authority. I Give me five minutes. I'll save you $15 million, right? I can make your LinkedIn profile shine, blah, 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 blah. Demonstrate it. There's a huge difference when you can actually demonstrate authority versus just claiming it. And even with the people that hire me, They'll see all those testimonials and social proof, and they still want me to demonstrate for them personally that it would work. And I'm the same way. I think you look at it and you see the the authority someone has, but you're still like, but will it work for me? And that's the value of giving away content, giving away ideas, putting your personality in. I call it infotainment. Give them the great information and also entertain them. So there you go. 
And so the, uh, the eight books then, how many of those are on LinkedIn and content marketing? So my story, like, again, lifelong writer, reader, son of two English teachers, journalist. My first, I'm going to look at the wall. I have them up here. <laughs> I wrote four novels, or I wrote three novels and tried to make a living as a freelance writer and author for a while. And then the first kind of nonfiction book I wrote was, a, uh, I started a syndicated newspaper column. So I compiled that into a book. LinkedIn Riches was kind of the first business book I wrote. And then I wrote a book called Fired Up, which is really about kind of how to make that leap from day job to, you know, your dream business. And then I wrote a book called Content Marketing Machine, which is kind of my whole business in a box. And with each of these books, then I'll put a course behind it and coaching and kind of model it that way. So, yeah, I've got eight different books. I mean, LinkedIn Riches is the one I'm known for. But what I like is once once you get into my world and my orbit, there's so much more I can share. And I think that's true of anyone that you work with is. People, once they get to know and like and trust you, the big thing is staying ahead of them and giving them more ideas and giving them more content. And the people I follow and the people I pay attention to and give my money to are lifelong learners that are always testing, trying, getting a new idea, reading a new book, implementing a new strategy, you're following along. And look at the people that you pay attention to, right? They're not stagnant. They're not beating the same drum or the same song over and over. It's like your favorite band. Do they keep putting out new albums or it gets really stale? So it, that's the the idea behind it. Yeah. So who do you pay attention to? I really, I've had the same business coach since 2012. He's like, I kind of don't want to even tell people because he's so good. But <laughs> no, his J- name is John Michael Morgan. Um, he's kind of a behind the scenes guy. I've had him since 2012. And I found him through his book. And basically his book was so good. I was like, how do I give you money to coach me? And that was the start of that relationship. And uh, the other people I really pay a lot of attention to online, I would say, I mean, I really follow like Gary Vaynerchuk. I just love Gary V. And you And talk about not being boring. That guy has such a strong brand. Love him or hate him and the swearing and the jersey. Like he's authentic. He's entertaining. And he's got good insights. You know what I mean? Like, I, I really enjoy him. Uh, I like Pat Flynn because he's another guy that's always testing and trying stuff. And I mean, you couldn't have two more polar opposites in Gary Vee and Pat Flynn, right? Pat Flynn's like the most polite, calm, like reminds you a little bit of Kermit the Frog. He's just so kind of nice and safe. Then you got Gary Vee who's like every other word out of his mouth is F-bomb and screaming, but they're both brilliant at business. Who else do I like? Chris Brogan, obviously. I'm a huge fan of his. You know, I, I really also read a ton. And one book that recently blew my doors off was a guy named Chet Holmes, The Ultimate Sales Machine. Have you ever heard of him? Amazing book. He's dead now, but he wrote it pre-internet. And it was all about 12 kind of ways to really build a a huge successful business that has a machine of sales. And he wrote it pre-internet. So he's talking about faxing people and stuff. (laughs) But it applied, like the strategies just overlay perfectly onto social media. Dale Carnegie, huge impact on me. Napoleon Hill, uh, the book that changed my life and changed my business, tripled my revenue in one month, was called Psycho Cybernetics by Maxwell Malt. Most people haven't heard of that, but he's kind of known as the grandfather of self-image. And that psychology, Tony Robbins, Jim Rohn, all these guys learned from Maltz. And the story behind him, really quick, since I know you want to hear it, Dominic, I'm going to keep going. So <laughs> yeah, 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 I don't know. <laughs> I'm going to roll. You put a quarter in me. But the deal with Maltz was he was a plastic surgeon in like the 20s and 30s. And what he learned was he would fix all these celebrities and Hollywood stars and make them look perfect. And they still would come back to him and go, I'm ugly. I'm hideous. I look terrible. And he's like, what do you mean? I just gave you plastic surgery. I gave you like no wrinkles, perfect face, whatever. And he realized they literally physically see themselves as ugly in the mirror, even though they're beautiful. And he's like, what is that? So he started pioneering this self-image psychology. And for me, and I share a lot of my story and my backstory, like I had a lot of traumatic things happening to me as a kid and abuse. And my dad died when I was really young. And so I've always struggled with self-image and struggle with depression and anxiety and negative thoughts, and negative mindset. And I've tried lots of different teachers and books. And Maltz, that was the first book I really read that just clicked for me, the mindset issue and how, why some people are successful and why others aren't. 
how to really understand all those, you know, cliches are true that you, you do become what you think about all the time. (laughs) Like your thoughts do control your destiny. And so I read that book and I literally the next month tripled my revenue because I started doing things I never did before because I had a better mindset. And I tell all these stories, uh, my new course, Stress-Free Selling, but there really is no limit on what you're able to achieve, but you've got to have the right mindset, the right thoughts. And the beautiful thing about it is it's not straining, it's not striving, it's not willpower. It's just kind of reprogramming yourself and doing it in a way that taps into all the positives. It, I mean, I go on all day about it, but that, I mean, there's a lot of amazing, you asked who I follow and those are probably some of the top ones. Yeah. That, well, that whole going into a sales, going in to sell something to somebody or wanting to influence somebody, you've got to not, you've got to be disassociated with the result. Otherwise you feel that pressure and they feel the pressure and it doesn't work for you. Yeah. The stench of desperation is what my friend Paul Klein calls it. Right. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, here's an example of how Psycho Cybernetics changed me. So I used to, because I had negative mindset, negative thoughts, I wasn't believing I had what it took. I would discount success. That was an anomaly, right? When I started visualizing and focusing on, no, I, I have had a lot of success. I will be successful. Like I can see it happening. I'm, I'm visualizing these fun, exciting goals. I, you know, I want to build a pool in my backyard. I want to have all this revenue. And all of a sudden, I started doing things on sales calls I never did before. Like one thing to start with, I wouldn't call people. Someone would email me kind of an objection or wishy-washy response about the webinar, the online course. In the past, I would just kind of hang my head and go, oh, bummer, and just write back, well, thank you, and kind of passively slough out the door. Now, when someone would email me, you know, they'd have their signature or their phone number. I would call them on the spot as soon as the email came in and said, hey, it's John Nemo. Thanks for the reply about the webinar and your thoughts on the course. And I thought it'd just be easier to call you and answer your questions or concerns about why you don't want to get in. Talk to me. What are you thinking? You know, and all of a sudden I'm all positive and bubbly. And they're like, wow, I can't. They were like kind of blindsided. Like, you call me. This is great. Like, I'll, I'm just so energetic and positive. They're like, OK, yeah, I want the course. You know what I mean? Like, I changed. Like, I was minimal on the phone. Like, I just I was taking actions I didn't ever take before. And I wasn't consciously thinking it and also learning how to deal with failure. Right. So like I just had someone yesterday, I thought I had them in the bag for a five figure sale and they were like bailed out. And they're like, well, my friend's going to do this whole LinkedIn program for free. <laughs> you can't compete with free. And I'm like, yeah, and you can't compete with how I got this Paramita $30,000 client 24 hours. So tell your friend good luck. Like, that's fine. Like they, before that would have crushed me. Right. I would have been like, I'm a failure. What? Like now I'm on like, who's the next lead? Who's next? And also not taking it personal anymore. Critics, trolls. I once had somebody write back to one of my emails in 72 point bolded font, F you, right? And I just, the old Nemo would have like, I should never mark it again. My email, I can't believe, like it went out to like thousands of people and one person wrote, I just laughed and I turned it into content and a great story about how to deal with trolls and how to deal with not letting critics shut you down. Like that's the different mindset now. You just view failure. Here's the analogy I wanted to share. Maltz explains failure this way. He talks about like a torpedo or a guided missile. When you launch it at a target, it does not go in a straight line. It has to constantly course correct and zigzag, because especially like a submarine, you're shooting a torpedo at a moving boat or whatever. It's zigzagging through the water. And he's like, that's how you look at achieving a goal. It's never a straight, easy line. And then, you know, understanding also reading more mindset people, who was it? Edison's like, I didn't fail 10,000 times to invent the light bulb. I just tried 9,999 ways that didn't work, right? Like the only time it's a failure is if you stop or give up, you know, and that's, that's really been the difference in seeing my business be successful over the long term is as long as I don't quit, then I won't lose. You know what I mean? Like when you lose is when you shut down and sit around. And you got to always be taking action and and also viewing failure objectively. Like you said, just, hey, what can I learn from this? Okay, I lost that client yesterday or prospect. Is there anything I could have done differently? You know, and so I was analyzing it going, oh, okay, next time I'm going to do this and this, but otherwise I'm moving on. Like I'm not going to hang my head about it. The money wasn't in the bank yet. That's the other thing I've learned with business is like, until the money's in, don't, you know what I mean? Like don't get celebrated and, and, 
think that. So there's there's lots of ideas, but I think success in business, I believe it's 98% mindset and 2% talent. I really do. I, I really think you see the people that are successful that are not as talented as you in business and life and athletics. And you go, why are they there? And I'm not. It's their mindset. They won't give up, period. Jim Collins did some analysis and he said he, one of the things he wondered whether it was that businesses that were successful were luckier. Right. And so he did So he did some research and he realized that the number of lucky events that they had, the successful and the unsuccessful business ad was the same. And he coined this phrase, return on luck, which is a mindset thing, which is, which is you see an opportunity and you take it as opposed to your mindset is that there are no opportunities coming your way. Yeah. Every day you wake up, you can open your eyes and you can see obstacles or opportunities, period. And things change. Like I thought I had, there's so many times in my business where I'm like, I'm pretty sure I got this all figured out, right? And now I'm on the mountaintop and I'm just going to sit on the beach and, you know, print money. And then something changes, right? And I'm like, wait, why isn't this? So you just have to like, you have to just adjust and see opportunities. So you've, you've gone from LinkedIn to content marketing. Now you've got a sales course. Is that because LinkedIn is is not as good as it was? Is, is there, have there been changes to the platform that have made it not as good or have people caught up? Is- no, it's better than ever. It's better than ever. I, and I still you know, spend a lot of time on LinkedIn. Kind of the reason I, I also have a course on webinars. And one of the reasons I created these other products and courses and books was people were constantly asking me, how do I build a business like you do? Like, especially my audience that I've attracted over the years is coaches, consultants, solo business owners, entrepreneurs. Like, I want to do what you do, which is sit at home all day in a t-shirt, scream into a microphone and make money, right? <laughs> I want to, how do you bottle up your knowledge and sell it online? How do you get people engaged? And so, so I started creating these other products to say, here's how I do webinars, right? Because that's my number one way that I sell products is on-demand webinars. And they're kind of, if you've never seen one, they're not your normal webinar. There's crazy movie clips and there's, you know, it's very like lots of crazy stuff going on, very entertaining. I looked at LinkedIn and I thought, here's what I thought, Dominic. If LinkedIn tomorrow shuts down, what would happen to me? If my whole business was based on LinkedIn, think about Facebook people 10 years ago or five years ago when, remember Facebook fan pages were all the rage? You got to build your fan page and get 100,000 fans. And then every time you publish on Facebook, 100,000 people see it. Well, then one day, all those people that spent all their blood, sweat, and tears building on Facebook's platform, Facebook said, hey, you know what? We're going to start charging you now to reach your own fans that opted in to hear your content. Guess what? We on the platform, now we won't let you reach all 100,000 fans. You got to pay money just to send a post to them. It's like, you don't want to build your platform on rented land. So I look at LinkedIn and I go, things are great. It's amazing. Yes, I'm you know having tons of success, but I want to have other ways that I can serve people especially so that if LinkedIn shut down tomorrow, I could pivot into content marketing, webinars, sales, coaching, mindset stuff. I mean, so it's like, I can also bring clients a lot more value, right? You might hire me as a LinkedIn guy, but we might meet and I might say, it's your mindset's the issue, right? Or I actually, I have a background in PR. I can help you get published, you know, in Inc. Magazine or this and that. And like, there's all these different ways. I don't know. I think at the end of the day, you want to build a really strong personal brand so people buy you and they like you and you want to have a lot to offer them. Because at the end of the day, you kind of become a commodity. You're just the LinkedIn guy. And I know a lot of my friends have said to me, other entrepreneurs are like, you're sitting on a gold mine. Don't go building gas stations, right? But the reality is if LinkedIn tomorrow said, we're going to start charging a dollar for every message you send, they could do that. Or if LinkedIn said tomorrow, you know, you have 20,000 followers, but we're going to cut them all off. What would I do? Right. I wouldn't want to be like, there goes my whole business. <laughs> so it's like, and also it's not the tools. It's the strategy. The strategy that I teach through all these programs is very simple. It's taking the real life you and overlaying it online, one-on-one building rapport so that people know, like, and trust you and get to get to feel your personality but also you demonstrate expertise through your content. And they go, you're all about me. You're likable. I feel a good connection with you. I like the fact that you're a family person, whatever your real life story is. And your tips are really helpful. 
how can I hire you to help me get what I want? And that's end of the day, that's what I'm trying to teach people to do. We talked there briefly about some tips for LinkedIn and people obviously know they can now come to your website and get your book for free. What are the sort of top two or three things people should do with LinkedIn? You know, who aren't business coaches, who may be, uh, you know, business owners of a a 10 million pound business. Right, right. Uh, Here's what I would say. So the, the top tips for anyone on LinkedIn, number one is client facing profile, like we talked about, and you can get I have templates and everything in the book covers how to do a client facing profile. So it's not a resume. The second tip I'll give anyone on LinkedIn, assuming you want to use it for business purposes, to get an investor, to make sales, to get some kind of win. All the money on LinkedIn is in the mailbox. All of it. Every penny, every pound, as my British friends would say, (laughs) is in the mailbox. What I mean is one-on-one personal messaging. All of the time on LinkedIn If you come to LinkedIn and treat it like the world's biggest virtual coffee shop, you will make a ton of money. Because what you do in coffee shops is you meet one-on-one, you build rapport, you break the ice, you get to know, like, and trust each other, and then you talk business. You ask prospect questions. You offer solutions. You have free value ideas and demonstrations. What really cracks me up about LinkedIn is people will come and ask all these questions. What about publishing content. What about LinkedIn ads? What about video? What about LinkedIn groups? What about LinkedIn? I'm like, none of it matters. End of the day, I just want you to make money, spend all your time in the mailbox. And also here's the big thing about it, Dominic, is LinkedIn recognizes this. They've made LinkedIn messaging very much like two kind of teenage girls texting each other, right? You can do emojis and GIFs, animated images. You can record little video messages in the LinkedIn mobile app send them directly to the prospect from your phone. So what I do with a really good prospect on LinkedIn that I connect with, I hold up my phone, it takes 10 seconds, and I hit a little button and send a video greeting to them. I say, hey, Dominic, John Nemo here, we just connected. Wanted to send you something a little unique, a little video message. It's always nice to put a name with a face, right? Hey, I see you're living in Britain, uh, Premier League fan, who's your team, right? Arsenal, whatever. Anyway, great to connect. Would love to know how I can help you out. I've got tons of free resources. So just send me back a thumbs up if you want me to send over blank. Like think about the difference there compared to 99.9% of LinkedIn messages you get. A personal video mentioning your name, which is like gold to a prospect. He said my name. He's looking at me like you're talking about me. You're talking about where I live. You're asking me about Arsenal and Liverpool and whatever and talking Premier League. And all of a sudden we're bantering. And you've immediately improved the trust level 100%. You're a real person now. You're not someone just trying to pick their pocket with an offer or ask for time. The other big tip I would give people on LinkedIn to kind of finish that thought is whatever you're asking of someone you connect with on LinkedIn needs to be in direct proportion to the amount of trust you've earned. If we're perfect strangers, Dominic, can connect, I don't get to ask you for a half hour phone call. I haven't earned that right. I don't get to ask you to go on an hour-long webinar. I don't get to ask you for a sales demo. I have to earn that right. It's worse than that. They want a half-hour phone call, but you've got to click on their Calendly link, and you've got to find a time in their diary for you to call them. It's like, yeah, Jesus, please. Yeah, it's what I would say. LinkedIn is very simple. Client-facing profile. Use the LinkedIn search features to find your exact ideal prospect, buyer, whatever it is. And then connect with them one-on-one and personalize the engagement through the one-on-one messaging and watch what happens. It's amazing. Well, it is. I was I was just thinking as you were talking, uh, this morning I got a message from somebody I was chatting with, I think last year, and their message to me this morning is, uh, we've grown enough that I now need your services. Please call me. Boom, right? You stayed in front of them. Like kudos to you that the other thing with LinkedIn is play the long game. One of the things I always tell people is, you can tag and you know organize your connections if you have LinkedIn Sales Navigator by city, by university or school, by job type, by industry type. And then you can find excuses to message them about non-work things. One of my favorite things here in the United States is I look at where people went to college or university and I love sports. So I'll talk about their university sports teams. Hey, I see your team just won a big basketball game. Congrats. But I have 100 people tagged who went to that school. I can copy paste that message to all 100. And they're like, oh, personal note about my alma mater. This is cool. Like, it's just banter. 
It takes very little time and it keeps you top of mind in a non-pressuring, just checking in if you want to work with me way. And that's the difference. But also it's sort of heartwarming that the 100 people that you send that message to, two of them know you've automated, but the other 98 think that you actually typed it individually every single time. It's like, it's just, it's just, you just go, oh, shucks. You don't know how this works. Well, and then you, you step up your game with personalized videos. Like I do do that. Like if I feel like I'm getting somewhere with this lead, I will pull up my phone uh, assuming I have showered and groomed myself, which isn't always the case because I'm a stay-at-home entrepreneur. You know? <laughs> like, but I will make a little video to just up the ante. And, and, and it works amazingly well. And I think, you know, I have a virtual assistant that I can, she can bang out 100 uh, one-on-one messages in an hour. Just copy, paste, change the name. So you kind of, you look at it two different ways. It's not necessarily a quantity. It's more quality. I happen to have 20,000 connections, so I have a lot of people I'm trying to reach, but I'm trying to personalize and scale. And then the, out of those 200 people that I sent a note about the football game to, you know, whoever writes back, now I've got some conversations going. Yeah. Well, and there's, there's, a, there's a furniture store in the UK called DFS. And the thing about DFS is when you go on TV, it's always the DFS sale finishes Friday. And when I see your messages come through, I often think that what you're doing is you're repeating the same message at the top of your funnel over and over and over again. But the thing is, it it will only land on people when they're in the mindset to see. Otherwise, it's sort of they filter it out. It's like, you know, unless you're buying a sofa, the DFS sale just washes over you and you don't even notice. And so, you know, so when people when people interact, they now think you can solve a problem for them. Right. And it's I offer content every month. I kind of learned with LinkedIn, you don't message people every day. I don't message them every week. I probably average once a month each connection. I I typically, it's either something personal, non-work banter, or better, it's usually a, I have a specific script I use for one-on-one LinkedIn messages where I ask permission. So I say, hey, Dominic, curious, are you interested in blank? And blank would be a benefit I think they might want. Hey, Dominic, curious, are you interested in using LinkedIn to find new leads? And then I say, the reason I ask is I recently put together a new on-demand free webinar that I thought you might be interested in. And then I ask permission. If you like, just reply yes or thumbs up emoji, and I can send you a link to the webinar. And then I take the pressure off. I finish and say, if not, no worries. Have a great one. And then each month, I find a new piece of content to offer. So the next month, it might be, hey, Dominic, hope you're doing well. Curious, are you a podcast fan? The reason I ask is, I've um, been having some great guests on my show lately, Nemo Radio. If you'd like to give it a listen, just shoot me back a thumbs up. I'll send you a link to the show. If not, no problem. Cheers. Next month might be a sales tip. And so you stay top of mind, like you said, Dominic. So eventually when they do engage, you're like, hey, the timing's right. Or this piece of content struck me. We've been looking for X, Y, Z. Yeah. And and so that, that was... Uh getting your sort of regular notes was one of those things that I took away, which is I might be saying the same thing, but for the people it's landing with, it's it's new every time. So there is value in that. You've got to keep repeating. John, I'm conscious of time. Uh, you've been very generous. Knowing what you know now, is there a piece of, is there some knowledge that you know now that you think, oh, that would be, that would be great if I'd known that then? Oh, 100% mindset. Ah, oh, right. Okay. I struggled in my business. I rode the revenue roller coaster for the first probably six years of my business. <laughs> like, great year, bad year, great year, bad, like total small business, right? And it was all mindset. Once I read Psycho Cybernetics and mindset finally clicked, like I said, I tripled my monthly revenue within 30 days and I finally built a steady approach. Uh, mindset, mindset, mindset. Like that's... If I, if I could go back and apply any specific principle, it's no tools, it's no software, it's no strategy, it's mindset. Because with a good mindset, you can really accomplish whatever the goal is that you need to get. And so does that show up for you in terms of the price that you charge for the work that you do? Yeah, it does. I mean, it shows up in a bunch of different ways. One is it shows up in how I approach getting over my own inhibitions. Oh, I don't want to bother people and call them. Well, just call them. What, you know, have a, like, I don't want to be pushy or, you know, like I don't want to send another email or I don't want to, I get over myself 
because I have a goal I want to attain. And then I also have confidence in charging prices and repelling people. Like here's a classic example. So of old me and new me. So this, so I'm selling my stress-free selling course and I'm like, Hey, you know, it's $2,000. There's a payment plan, a closing enrollment, blah, blah, blah. This guy writes me. He's like, what if I do 20 payments of $97 and you give me another course for free? And if I get business, then I'll keep paying. But if I don't get business, I want a full refund, but I get to keep everything. This is like, <laughs> so I'm going to walk into the Apple store and say, you know what? Why don't you give me that new MacBook computer? If I get business from it, I will gladly pay for it. But if I don't, your product didn't work. Right. So you don't do that in real life. What I've figured out, and especially for my people that are coaches, consultants, trainers, speakers, your knowledge is worth a lot of money. Your experience is worth a lot. The biggest struggle that people have, Dominic, is how to price themselves if they're offering knowledge, coaching, consulting. That's the number one thing is understanding that you have a lot of value and you have to be careful with what you share because. Why will people buy the cow if the milk is free? If you get tire kickers on the phone, they're like, well, what about this? And what about this? And what about this? And I had to learn that too. When I was a struggling author, I remember calling a literary agent and picking his brain. And he's like, I got to start charging you for this. Like this is cool. <laughs> he said that to me. I'm like, oh, like I didn't realize that, you know? And what I say now is like, hey, look, this is what I think my knowledge is worth. I've earned this. I have this platform. I've gotten... Like I got somebody a $30,000 client in 24 hours. I think I can charge you what I want to charge. You know what I mean? Like not being cocky, not being a jerk, not being arrogant, because when you build a successful business and get people results, they are happy to be references. They are happy to be testimonials. So I have the ability to say to someone that I'm proposing a five-figure program to, here's three people you can call. This person got $100,000 in business. This person got 50 grand. This person got 35 grand, 24 hours. They will talk to you. Like they will validate what I'm telling you. And people are like, okay. Because yes, claiming it is one thing, but having people that proved it out. So yeah, I, I think that mindset helps with, with confidence, with not haggling on price, with feeling like this is what it's worth and, and moving people to a yes or no. That's the core thing is just, there's too many good prospects out there for you to waste your time trying to convince someone that doesn't want to be convinced. Just stop. Just move on. And that's why I love content marketing, Dominic. The more you put out and the more you share, the more people come to you who are convinced, who are excited, who are in that state of mind of, I really like what you're saying. Your free stuff is great. How do we work together? What does it look like? How do I afford you? And that's, that's the state you want to be in. And you've mentioned Cybernetics book a couple of times, so we've got that. Are there any other couple of books you think people should read? The book I launched my business on was called How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie, written in 1936. Still, I mean, it's I built my whole business around that book. I really built my whole business around that one line, which is your ideal prospects don't care about you. They care about themselves morning, noon, and after supper. So make it all about them. Uh, those two books... I read all the time. I think that is core. You know, another book that was really helped me when I was building my platform, getting those A-list people was called Never Eat Alone by Keith Ferrazzi. And the one line, and it was all about how he turned himself from a nobody into a somebody. The one thing that really struck me when he said, when you're approaching big shot people, he said, folks are folks. Just treat them like a normal person. Don't be a fanboy or a fangirl. Don't gush over them. Don't make a scene, just talk to them. He said, the higher level person it is, the bigger superstar they are, the more they will love just being treated normally because everyone's fawning over them. So when I would meet these A-listers, I would just talk to them like a regular person, like you're not a big deal, sorry. You know what I mean? Like at the end of the day, I'm like, they're not a big deal. They're a freaking person. They're not a big deal. I'm sorry, nor am I. Like we're all human and we're all on the same plane. Like at the end of the day, we have different gifts and talents. Society rewards them in certain ways, but it's still just a person. And if you treat people with that idea, you kind of command and control the conversation and the respect. Because if if you come in desperate and needy and fawning, the other person's like, well, I'm going to get whatever I want out of you. Whereas if you come in like, 
I'm really interested in your stuff. I mean, you got a great background, but I'm a little, have some questions if you can really perform for me. They're going to immediately be like, well, I'll show you. Yes, I can. Right? Like you want that. You know, I'm even exploring with some people that want to become a client saying, well, why would you be a good client for me? Why would I want to take you on? Not that any of us want to turn away money. Yeah, but you've only got a limited amount of time. I mean, somebody said to me at the beginning, Dom, if you want to be a successful coach, pick clients that you can work with. That's absolutely true. Yeah. The worst experiences I've ever had are clients where all these red flags were going off, but I just wanted the money. And it ended up no amount of money was worth the hell they put me through. (laughs) Whereas I knew better, but I wanted the paycheck. And I think at the end of the day, you can't, that's the mindset too. Like you can't be scared and you can't be like, I really need this right now. I better, like you got to stick to your guns and be like, it's not worth it. This person's going to be a terrible fit. They're going to call me at all hours. They're going to bother me on holiday or vacation. Like, no, no, no. Or as my business coach says, just charge them a jerk fee and double your rates. (laughs) (laughs) I know that's a good idea too. Like make it worth it. So yeah. John, thank you very much indeed for your time today. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks for having me on. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. As a token of your appreciation, it'd be fantastic if you could go wherever you're listening and leave me a review. Those reviews really help other people find this podcast. For all information relating to this episode, you can go to dominicmonkhouse.com forward slash podcast. And there you'll find some fantastic show notes, additional reading and links relating to this episode. You can also find my blog and the past editions of my subjectively not crap newsletter. The simplest thing to do on the website is to sign up and I'll update you each week on the most interesting articles that I've read on all things relating to scaling up high performing teams, net promoter score, company culture, etc. For social, you can find me on Twitter, Dom Monkhouse and LinkedIn at Dominic Monkhouse, although LinkedIn is probably the best way to reach me, share your questions and comments and, and perhaps even recommend a guest for a future edition of the Melting Pot podcast. Thanks for listening.